thank you so much. A uh, pleasure being here. A uh, warm welcome once again. A full house here. Uh, good evening once again, and uh, warm welcome to the panel. Let me um, uh, give the privilege of the opening comments to the host of the evening, uh, Anil uh, Chopra, to set the context uh, of the discussion. Thanks, uh, Siddharth, and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Uh, well, the budget uh, we have all heard, and uh, we read the newspapers, we read the analysis, the comments. Except the uh, provident fund taxation, there is hardly any other topic which is being uh, debated or discussed, uh, you know, uh, in major forums. Uh, this budget has been described as transformational, and uh, if we study the budget from the point of view of an economist, then obviously there are a lot of plus points in this budget because the fiscal deficit has been contained or maintained at 3.5%, which is very healthy for our future growth, which also augurs well for the debt markets if, if the target is met. And also, all the important sectors, whether they are rural or social or education or infrastructure, which are the growth drivers of our economy, have been well attended to, have been well taken care of. The ailing banking system, there is a, a clear effort to make do good things there in terms of recapitalization, some of our public sector banks. And also, the status quo has been maintained, coming primarily to our clients, most of you who are here, thinking from your point of view, there were a few apprehensions which we all had before the budget which did not come true, so we should count the blessings rather than saying that this, that didn't happen or this didn't happen. Most importantly, the long-term capital gain definition, there was a fear that the one year might be extended to two years or three years. That didn't happen. That's a very, very good news. Also, there were expectations that the service tax would be enhanced significantly from 14.5% to maybe 16 or 165 in order to prepare the country for GST. That didn't happen. So I think uh, there are a lot of pluses which we see in this budget. And uh, even uh, the markets also have hinted at that. I'm going to Chandresh to start off with his opening comments. Over to you, Chandresh. Yeah, so uh, I think if one were to look at holistically and just say a little from a distance of uh, what <coughs> one feels when, you know, when you've seen this budget, I think the one word which comes to me uh, is relief. And I want to get into that. I think I don't think there were any great expectations from the budget, especially if you were to look at from a market's perspective, the market went into this budget with very low expectations. But yes, there were lots of worries. A couple of them have already been mentioned by Anil, so I won't go into that. But from my perspective, I think there were three things, or I'd say three challenges as we were you know, uh, facing as an economy, in which we wanted this budget to address you know, the, these three, three, three important things. And I cannot uh, you know, uh, commend the finance minister enough for sticking to that 3.5% fiscal deficit number. I think in this environment, when there's low growth and there's problem and every country is trying to pump prime or get some, out, some growth out of in, in their economies, uh, I think just the fact that he, he did not yield into the temptation, and it would have been, I think, reasonably well understood by the market because of the difficult conditions, because of the fact that there is a pay commission award, because of the fact that you know, there, he had to do something for the rural sector where there is significant stress. I think just the fact that you stuck to 3.5% is, I think, a very, very big statement not because it affects the fiscal deficit too much, but more in terms of credibility. I think one of the things which, if you talk to most business people, whether local business people or international business people, is people have kind of written off India as somebody who's not transparent, there's no credibility. And I think this should go a long way in kind of assuaging some of those concerns. It will obviously not do everything, but I think it's a very, very bold step in saying that, okay, last year we said we will be at three and a half. We are st sticking to three and a half despite all the problems we have. And then next year they've already given out that it's going to be 3%. So of the three things, first is obviously the fiscal number, and I think uh, full marks on that. The second issue is about rural stress. Yes, so that's a, a big one. 
Uh, we know that there has been a problem, two failed monsoons, very little increase in MSPs. Large part of the country is really, really struggling. So there's been there's enough there. I think I don't want to go too much into it in the immediate in the beginning comments. But the nature of the spend on the rural side is not just a handout that you just increase uh, the uh, MN Riga and just you know dole out money on crop insurance, etc. There is enough there on roads and irrigation, etc., which is more on uh, infrastructure building. The third problem, and that is actually a deep-rooted problem, right? And everywhere in the world, and more so in our case, uh, especially looking at the fact that we are aspiring to be a six to eight percent kind of growth economy, is the lack of investment demand. Now, the government has obviously done enough through the rail budget, through the uh, allocation to roads, etc., to have a reasonably meaningful number. The big problem is how do you get the private sector into the uh, to come and start to spend and you know, get, do capital expenditure or, or, or put in investments. So I think that's where uh, longer term problems <coughs> remain. And that has got little to do with the budget, but more on the policies. What I'm now going to do is to go across to Mr. Bala Subramanyam for his opening comments. Over to you. Yeah. I think, of course, uh, more or less I echo what uh, Chopraji and, uh, and Sandresh mentioned. The way I read is, uh, so one, is not something which is a, a thoughtful thing that we every year we expect something will come. Therefore, it will have a huge impact in our the way we look at the way forward. I think that nothing was there. Which is essentially continuing the broad philosophy of maintaining um, stability in terms of various policy frameworks. And that's something which I think uh, it goes to uh, say that you need to maintain um, the sanctity of what the government of India has to do with respect to their spending. There's a lot more uh, control that they brought in terms of uh, un unnecessary spending where they normally they increase the expenditure significantly without looking at the revenue. And that, I think, is normally comes. I think when we say 3.5% fiscal, normally we go back and start looking at the numbers with the lens and then we come back and then say these numbers cannot be, is not achievable, this cannot be done, that cannot be done. Therefore, if I add up all the math, it doesn't come to 3.5, it will come to 3.7. This is historically I have seen, we as a money manager, we always go back and then say, find enough reasons why the number cannot be believed. And this time for a change, no such things were there. I think you do any math, there is one math says, yes, it's not um, achievable. If you look at another math, which is basically in excess duty collections, He's not been very aggressive. So therefore, if you add up these two things, the net sum is zero. So therefore, one has to have uh, some belief what they are saying is uh, true. Second is, um, um, I think this budget, um, uh, I was jo jokingly telling somebody in the afternoon, of course, I have both the side consultants sitting on the, both the end. Um, they, I, my belief is uh, this budget, they have removed a lot of these uh, so-called uh, gray areas. And they have gone and explained uh, removed the sections, uh, rather streamlined the section in such a manner, you and me do not interpret the way we have to interpret to suit us. And they have given a very clear uh, clarification in uh, some of the sections which are generally being interpreted historically. A case in point, I'll tell you, uh, is a holding company which is, uh, which is basically in the holding company has got investments in equity. The income tax authorities always says that you have a holding company, you have investment business, whatever you borrow in that business, the expenditure that you have in that business, I can't treat them as an expenditure. Now, what will you treat? So, but income tax authority has got an authority right to say that it cannot be treated as an expenditure. Therefore, I will not allow you to take this expenditure and adjust again the in income. And this budget has killed that. So, basically, uh, it's a black and white. As if it is an expenditure, stick an expenditure, deduct it from your income and pay tax and what is left. There are many such, uh, such uh, regulations. Uh, they have looked at sections and deep, deep dive and see to it those uh, uh, things are not again coming back, giving more leeway for the income tax authorities to run after everybody. I think that's something which is done, which I see a big positive. And second is, um, I think with respect to the uh, rural, I think Chandrish also mentioned about very high focus on uh, rural. There are one or two things in my view, I think is, is coming pretty big time. I think the second largest subsidies in the country 
uh, is uh, is the fertilizer subsidy. First, of course, subsidy is is the food subsidies, and second is uh, fertilizer subsidy, and then rest all come. The last few years, uh, the government has done a fantastic job uh, about um, uh, reducing the subsidies uh, in fuel, LPG, and so on and so forth. And they continue to focus on that. Then, how do I actually differentiate on the subsidies between the rich and uh, the poor? And um, they are taking some kind of bold steps in uh, creating a, announcing a pilot project on fertilizer subsidy that is being given, uh, whether it reaches the poor or whether it reaches the rich farmers. They can't say it so openly, but at the same time, they need to also ensure that um, it doesn't go to the rich. It just goes only the uh, the people who deserve it. That I think this budget has addressed that. I think it's creating a roadmap, including making Adar as a way in which the money can be disbursed for subsidies. Divesh, your uh, quick opening comments uh, with regard to the key takeaways that uh, you have uh, read out of the budget. Sure. So, uh, from an indirect tax standpoint, I think largely uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are three broad themes that we could pick up uh, from the way the budget is structured. I think uh, mostly, and you know, if you have to put a percentage, almost 70% of the weight of the budget is on pushing Make in India. And uh, the various uh, provisions that have come around uh, creating thrust for making more and more value addition uh, within India. The second uh, piece is uh, rationalization or you know, elimination of all the gray areas and getting us out of jobs. Uh, so uh, that's another uh, focus area, which is, let's say, another 20% in indirect tax. And the remaining 10% is uh, to get lawyers out of jobs and uh, uh, try and uh, you know, comprehensively address uh, litigation and, and see how can you expedite uh, litigation and reduce some of the disputes uh, that keep arising or frivolous assessments that keep getting done. So Gaurav, as the last speaker, but not the least really, you have the most important subject to quickly summarize for us uh, with regard to direct tax, the key highlights. Yeah, so if I look at the budget for a change, uh, there are no shocks or surprises in the budget. There are few surprises uh, which are there. I think that's on more on the personal tax front, which, you know, I think the sudden thing on the EPF withdrawal being taxed is interesting, which, which was not expected really. Actually, the expectation was that to make it equal with the NPS scheme, it would the NPS would be changed, or the national pension scheme would become exempt, 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 rather than remain at exempt, exempt, and tax. So what he did is he changed it. The PF is also now taxable at withdrawal up to, uh, up to 60%. And that may be rolled back. We don't know. The second thing was on the dividend. Uh, you know, the dividend is subject to a dividend distribution tax. Uh, but now, if you earn more than 10 lakhs in individual or HUF or a firm, you earn more than 10 lakhs of dividend, then that amount is taxed at 10%. So I think from a personal tax front, these were the two surprises. Uh, if you look at it from the corporate tax side, uh, from a made in India, make in India perspective, I think he has stuck to his promises. Last year, he had said that he would reduce the tax rate from 30 to 25 over four years. And at the same time, he would remove the incentives and deductions. So he has announced the deduction and incentive removal roadmap, which is more or less in conjunction with what he had announced in December. And secondly, you know, for manufacturing with companies who don't take any of the incentives, he has given a rate of 25%, which is quite a, quite a bold move and, and interesting. And let's see how many pick that. The other interesting part is from an international tax perspective, India, I think, on the base erosion and profit sharing, which is an OECD and G20 initiative, I think we've really gone ahead of the curve. And we have a, you know,